Welcome into Coast and presented by Flow Hockey TV. I'm Evan Pivnik, voice of the Adirondack Thunder, joined as always by David Fine. He is the voice of the Iowa Heartlanders. And today we are joined by Kelly Cup champion, broadcaster of the Fort Wayne Comets, Shane Alberani. Shane, you guys did it. Congratulations. We did. And uh, I'm glad you said the voice because I don't have a voice anymore. So people forget. I, I, I did, did call a few hockey games this year. <laughs> One of seven. the, yeah. Go ahead, David. Now, seven. Well, you guys didn't do the 72 game thing, a little bit of a shorter, a shorter look, but um, final minutes, final seconds of game four um, emotions just. Give us, give us, give us the story here. Those final few minutes of the game. What was, if anything, was going through your head besides trying to dictate the action? Well, it, it was a close game. It was two one. So you know, I, I didn't have anything. I didn't want to prepare anything. You know, I, I didn't want to jinx myself. I wanted to be something organic, and you know, I kind of had something in my head, and then. Then we decided to ice the puck with 1.9 seconds and it kind of slowed the momentum. So I was like, oh, well, that kind of kind of killed it a little bit. But you know what? You, you had 1.9 seconds and, and one drop of the puck and that was it. And I uh, I mean, it, I mean, it's still it's still trying. I'm still trying to to just get everything straight in my head because it was such a uh, just a crazy night. And to have, you know, the, the building full, 10,477, I mean, when that, when we didn't even hear the horn, you just heard the crowd. And it was just like a big rumble that finally, you know, it was like life was back to normal. So that, that's really what I kind of took away from it. It's like, wow, things are, are back to what we were used to. It's like you had yourself like a Sam Rosen moment when the Rangers, I know when the Rangers won the Stanley Cup in 94, I think the same thing happened to them. Sam Rosen was ready to make his big call. And all of a sudden I think it was an icing. Yeah. So then less than two seconds later, they had to do a face off. Everyone knew it was going to happen, but still, you know, you guys got that done. And we talked a little bit before we started recording, you guys got it done on home ice, which had to be extra special. You mentioned the fans being back in full capacity. Just what was the buzz around town? Once you knew that the comments were in the Kelly cup final, and then, well, ultimately going to be Kelly Cup champions. Well, I mean, as soon as the final started, I mean, starting uh, right right after uh, the the Allen series, uh, you know, Fort Wayne. I mean, it was around the clock media coverage, every TV station, radio stations, the newspaper, obviously. But we get great coverage here in Fort Wayne. But I had never quite seen anything like that. I mean, it was it was crazy. I mean, we were there was a player, a coach. Uh, myself, uh, GM president on every TV station, uh, leading into the finals and through the finals. Um, and every newscast led with that. I mean, it was, it was great. I mean, that, 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 uh, we kind of caught comet fever again, uh, as the first cup that we've won, uh, in, in nine years, the first one in the ECHL. So it had been a while and, uh, first one in the, again, in the ECHL, which made it also really, really cool. But again, it was one of those things where, wow, we're finally, finally back to normal it kind of brought the city together because that was the first real big event that really in the state of indiana outside of uh, the indy 500 uh, that had that many people in it so uh, yeah i mean it, it was just 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 a, a stroke of we're, we're normal again and i think that's why i think that's why we had you no know, comet fever throughout the week Shane, back in uh november um the entire north division opted out um some teams from the central division were kind of trying to figure out their way there as well. Um, it wasn't really that long ago. <laughs> it's really only seven and a half, eight, eight months that it may have not happened for you guys. And it could have been, yeah. we're not, we're not playing. And even then, what if something happens in, you know, January in the country, things are looking a lot worse and then who know, you know, with attendance yeah. restrictions and whatnot. So um, your, your, I, I hate, it's not even really a question, but you know, take us back to that and <laughs> what those few months were like the October's November's of, of your world in 2020 um, of what that was like being in Fort Wayne world. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, we, it, like you said, you know, we were very uncertain. Uh, we knew we, you know, we were very optimistic even all summer long, you know, we just kind of kept pushing the date back and, you know, we were going to give ourselves every opportunity to play and it got to, you know, the, the day where we had to decide. And I think, you know, as of that morning, I don't think we really knew we, we, we didn't know. And, and literally, you know, maybe 
10 hours later, we, we just decided, you know what, we're going to play, we're going to do this because next year is our 70th anniversary. We, you know, the Comets have been around that long, the second oldest minor league hockey franchise and ownership was pretty much, we're not going to let that stop us. We're, we've never missed a season. We're not going to start now. And that's, that, that's kind of was one of the deciding factors as well. And we had so much support from the community, the Coliseum, the fans, and mostly the business partners as well, wanting us to play. Um, and that's, and that's, was really that, that put us over the edge. So, you know, it was a waiting game. Uh, you know, we were, we were optimistic, but we we're also prepared for the worst case scenario as well. And, you know, when the league started in December, you know, there were all kinds of COVID cases. There was all that. So we were trying to give ourselves as much time as possible. I think we were the only team in the league that didn't have one positive case. So, you know, we set ourselves up for success. Uh, but, you know, that that mad dash to the start from the day we announced we were playing on January 5th, to the day we started on February 12th was just an incredible effort. I mean, we pulled together what normally would take us, you know, three, four or five months and we did it in six weeks. And it was, uh, I mean, just an amazing effort by everybody. And we don't have that big of a staff, but we managed to pull it off. And, it, you know, people will never understand exactly what it took for every team in this league to play. I mean, just, just a crazy amount of preparation and, 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 uh, and uh, caution when it came to everything and, you know, everything, eventually worked out in the end. We didn't, you know, we, we didn't think we'd be playing until July, but here we are. <laughs> so that uh, you said that kind of month leading up, um, how many hours of sleep did you get a night? What was the work life balance? What, how many hours yeah. were you in the office a day? <laughs> oh, you know what? I, there was one day where I started at 6 a.m. and my phone didn't stop ringing until 10 p.m. Uh, <laughs> that happened a couple of times. So it was around the clock, you know, and I remember, uh, it was Super Bowl Sunday. I actually got to sit down and actually had to start to work to put on the, the, the media packs and to do our bios for our players. It took me that long to get to that point. And it took, you know, Super Bowl Sunday. That's how I remember that <laughs> to, to do all of that. So, you know, it was around the clock seven days a week. Uh, it was crazy, but but well worth it when, you know, I actually, you know, I, I got to got to wheeling for that first game. And, uh, you know, I wasn't traveling with the team. I was traveling myself. And again, I, you know, pull into to West Banco and it's like, wow, this is really going to happen. This is, this is just amazing. <laughs> Every team needs those glue guys and those nice mix between veterans, rookies, and guys in the middle. And Fort Wayne always seems to have a good crop of veterans coming into play for them, whether they be <laughs> overseas or have played pro for a long time. What was special about this year's team in terms of that group that was able to take it to the next step and, and to capture a championship? Well, you know, getting Justin Vive very late in the process was huge. Uh, you know, he was a guy who was waiting around kind of seeing what was going to shake loose. Uh, and then the day we decided we were going to play, he was on board. And that was I'll tell you, that was one of the big moments that I knew this team was really going to come together. You already had great veterans. You had AJ Jenks, the captain. You had Sean Sadlowski, who's been here uh, eight years now. And uh, that was, I really think he was the final piece to the puzzle. With, uh, I remember when we won in Tri, in Tri City in the USHL back in 2016. You, it, you know, it's funny, you look at the roster five, six years from now, and you can kind of pick out a few not only key moments in a season, but like you can pick out a few moments from each, some guys here and there. That's like, I remember this guy had a, you know, a big game here yeah. or, you know, Oh, I, this guy was great at doing this. And you kind of just realize that how, you know, the kind of the full team nature of the game. Um, are there any, yeah, obviously Sean Sidlowski and guys like that, Justin Vive that put up a lot of the points, they're going to get a ton of the, and ton of the credit um, and the leadership group and the coaches, but who are some guys that, you know, you want to remember five or six years from now is like those, those, those guys that kind of just helped make it a little bit more complete than just maybe the big point guys or, you know, the goaltenders type thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, Brandon Hawkins, I mean, I know he led the team in points, but what a, an addition he was another, another late ad. And you know, this guy has got, you know, his, his uh, wrist shot is probably an NHL wrist shot slap shot. NHL caliber as well so I expect to see him at a higher level but he was a guy who so many memorable games that he had you know he had a Texas hat trick down in Indy and he had a hat trick uh in the first game of the finals I mean he, he's the one that that really stands out but uh, the the thing is our defensive core that was really the big thing you had uh, a lot of rookies back there and uh 
that was going to be our our uh, the paramount to the success was going to be the defenseman. It really was. So, I mean, I really take my hats off to the defenseman because they blocked a lot of shots throughout the season. They were pretty fearless. So, uh, yeah, when I go back to games, I just think of some of those defensive games we had, especially in the playoffs. Brandon Hawkins, you mentioned he had a little bit of AHL time this year playing with Rochester. Got to know him uh, when I was in college, went to Bowling Green around the same time, and then he ended up going to Northeastern. And again, one of the things that he was always touted was that wrist shot. And then I don't think you really get to experience it uh, until you get to see it in person. And at that point, it's, you know, it's off the charts. And I agree with you that it's an NHL caliber shot as well. Another guy who's on the back end, and you mentioned it's a, you know, a lot of the rookies on the, on the back end there for, uh, uh, for the, what are you guys laughing at? Well, I'm laughing at you because you're going to say Matthew Berdor. I am waiting for it. So get I just me, I could have let I me get to that. You. I thought you guys were having some sort of chat behind my back and like yeah, making fun of like little, my maroon shirt or something. Yeah, like that. private messages go just flying back and forth oh, here between chat. So what about Matthew well, Berdor? Do so you want to ask? Well, the people probably here in Glens Falls would probably love to know what Matthew Berdor uh, brought to the championship team uh, from his years here in Glens Falls to all his hockey experience and now a Kelly cup champion. Is that what you guys wanted? Is that why you're both laughing at me? <laughs> Broads was an absolute rock. I mean, I think he played pretty much every game. I, maybe he missed a game or two. Uh, actually one of the moments I'll remember most about Broads was we were in uh, Wheeling and I, I think it was the second game of the season and we took a bunch of penalties. There was a lot of guys in the box and he was the only guy on the ice to take a face off. So Matthew Brodor taking a face off was, was a really cool moment very early in the season. <laughs> yeah, that's a, uh, that's a career highlight type moment. Um, I'm glad we got our Matthew Brodor hit in for Evan um, as well. He's, he's such he's, a good player. He's a really good player. Absolutely. So he, he yeah. scored the, he scored the biggest goal in Adirondack Thunder history. Of course I have to ask about Matthew Brodor. <laughs> Triple Three overtimes. Overtime. Yeah. yeah. Triple overtime against Manchester. Second round? Second round. Went to did Florida. That, did, did that advanced you guys, if I remember right? Game five yep. or game six? Yep. Game, uh, game six. Game six at game Manch. Six. Would, at game, Manch. would game seven have been at Manchester too? Or, um, or was that one of the weird ones where you guys no, got like I, five home games because Manchester I, just couldn't I, get it together? I, I don't remember exactly. I think... <laughs> I think it was coming home to us, game seven, but we were depleted. Like we had no one healthy, which is why we lost in the third round. We had Connor Riley, who was sitting on the bench the entire game hurt. He sat for six periods and didn't play a shift just to have the illusion that we had, had a healthy <laughs> roster. Oh my God. Like the full bench, the full bench mentality. <laughs> the full bench, yep. Um, yep. Shane, uh, we asked it before the show, but if you could please show off your t-shirt there, <laughs> uh, how many do you own? How there many, it is. Uh, how, yeah. <laughs> Available Have now you, at the comments <laughs> store. You, you said you've watched it, which I'm actually surprised about. I have, I have watched it because there was no other choice. Uh, <laughs> it took way too many beer baths uh, last Friday night. It, it, it had to go. <laughs> uh, the feeling, how good was the beer or the water? If you prefer to just, you know, make it a little PG here, which I'm not about. We're not about on coasting once you hit past the 10 minute mark. <laughs> Uh, especially in the final episode of our season uh, as we finish up the, uh, you know, our Kelly cup wrap up here. But um, I remember drinking some beer out of the Clark cup and it was just like, it was just, you know, it's special. Like it just, it's the best beer you ever taste. Um, so the Kelly cup, how did the beer taste? You know, what type of beer it was? Was there a little uh, mixing action I'm going on? Really you know, I'm not even a beer drinker. So it's like, I, you know, it was actually more of a foreign taste to me because I haven't had a beer in probably 25 years. Uh, so <laughs> it, uh, no, it was wonderful. I mean, I've been around, this was my sixth cup with the Comets. And this was really the first time that I felt to really be an active participant in the locker room, and enjoy the, 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 the moment because it was my first as broadcaster. So I mean, I had been with this team, you know, on the road, everybody, uh, you know, so I, I kind of felt comfortable enough to kind of hop in. And the guys certainly welcomed me into the dog pile in the, in the dressing room and immediately brought the cup over to me. So, you know, I, that, I mean, that was that was really special moment because the guys really kind of took me in and like, you know what, Shane, you're, you're drinking from this cup now kind of a moment. So, yeah, I mean, it was it was it was amazing. And and to have so many moments with some of the players. And I had a great one with Sean Solowski. You know, we've been together 
for eight years now. My, my first solo Comet broadcast without Bob Chase, Sean Zulowski. It was his first Comet game. It was first my first broadcast. So we got to share a couple of really cool moments there after the game. And that's the, that's the thing that I'm going to just remember forever. For you two guys, because you are now have called championship broadcasts in your life. I hope to do so one day. Uh, wh- when do you know to, to, to end the broadcast? Let's do some broadcaster uh, <laughs> stuff here. When do you know after it's obviously you're going to re, you know, recap what great of a year it was. And then, but you see the celebration going on the ice and you kind of have to wrap things up. When do you know that it's time to, you know, head down and uh, enjoy some, some cup adult beverage beverages. Well, I, I mean, we kind of had it planned because uh, in, in years past, we kind of went uh, what Bob Chase used to do. He would, he would actually hand it over back to the studio and he would head down. And that's pretty much what it was. It was games over. He's going down to celebrate and he would take a microphone and get, and get interviews on the ice. And that's exactly what I did. I took, uh, the game was over. I, you know, took in the moment of the dog pile and all that and the crowd. And, you know, we went, we had a, we had about a two, two half minute break, came back. I said, comments have won the, the, the Kelly cup. Stephen Harper had both goals. Dylan Ferguson got the win. I'm going downstairs. Here's the studio. I'll be back in about five minutes. And that's where it was. And then after a, a few uh, interviews down on the ice, you know what, my board op, he texted me. He's like, you know what, we're done. Go celebrate. <laughs> and he, he ended the broadcast. <laughs> I remember, uh, I remember with Tri City there, where um, I went through some narration of the cup the, of the Clark Cup being passed around, um, and then the, in my mind, I remember it kind of flipping, like I'm done now. <laughs> you know, like your, <laughs> your mind just kind of like in that moment, you're excited, you're happy, but yeah, like your mind kind of just flips to like, I am done with this now. Like this, yeah. the people, the people know I, I, you know, you've done enough and it's time to, uh, time to go down. So that, no, that's wonderful. It brings back some hearing your stories kind of brings back a six-year-old, you know, memories yeah. from, from me, which is or five-year-old memories from, uh, from me, which is great. Um, city of Fort Wayne is, you know, I mean, the people that are listening and are going to from Fort Wayne know this and even some folks around the central division and, you know, just hockey fans in general, but like um, the, the meaning of that, of the team to the town. um, I wish it was that way in every community. So you've been there for more than 20 years, um, you know, an average, an average Friday, Saturday night in January, what kind of what kind of buzz is is there? Is there a is there yeah. really a buzz? Yeah. Oh no, there there is a buzz throughout the season. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's hockey night in Fort Wayne. It's something that's been going on now. We're going into, into season number seventy. Uh, so it, it's been. Uh, I, I think actually it, it may be the, the second or third oldest business in Fort Wayne is still operating. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, so no, I mean, it is, it's such, it, it's so entrenched in, in the Fort Wayne uh, community. I mean, it, it's, it's crazy. Uh, you know, when you have that many generations, you know, especially, you know, you go to, you go to a game, you know, you have people who were there the very first game in 1952, and then you have a guy who is going to his first game or bringing his kids or a kid is there his first game. It's just, it's so generational. Like I grew up in Fort Wayne. I've worked for the team for 24 years, but before that I was just a kid in the stands and, you know, I passed that along. Uh, my family passed along to me. I passed along to my daughter and to nieces and nephews. And that's how it, it's so entrenched. And it's, it's, it's wonderful. You know, you run into older fans who will just sit there and like to tell you a story. I, I mean, I'm now the old guy. So it's like, I tell stories about, Hey, you know what, when I was uh, 12 years old in 1986, this happened, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm that guy now. And those people are just everywhere. So, you know, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's really hard to describe. I mean, it's, it's such, I mean, only, you know, Hershey, obviously in the AHL and the original six, you know, maybe are the only, only communities that really kind of possess uh, what we have here. And, I mean, it's, it's just really hard to describe. And I always like to, I mean, when other fans come to town, obviously we have got, you know, good location where, where Toledo fans and Kalamazoo fans and, you know, even teams who've been around a long time, you know, and I enjoy having them come in and they, and they get to see the atmosphere of, of this and the, and the tradition. I mean, it, I mean, it is a big deal. So that's why it was such a big deal for us to play. One of my favorite things about the 
you know, the whole, the whole tradition of Fort Wayne hockey is when you go into the arena and from, I, I really took it in the first time I went because we went through, you know, a morning skate, whatever it was, I was kind of by the bench, by the locker room and you look up and you could see kind of where the renovations were and right. expansion of the arena. And you kind of think to yourself, wow, there's a lot that has happened in this arena and in this franchise. Cause you could see, you could say, you know, Oh, some year they renovated here and then they expanded here, but you could see it all as you're looking up at the rafters. And I think that's probably the coolest thing about it. And that's really when it kind of hits you that there's a lot in that franchise. Yeah. I mean, and even just the history of the building as well. I mean, not just comments. I mean, everything that's gone in the Coliseum over the past 70 years, it's, it's such a great old building and, you know, there's not that many buildings that old around anymore. So, you know, it has been renovated. Actually, it only had gone through one renovation. That was in 2002 when the roof was raised and all the seats were replaced. So it's, it's still uh, relatively new as far as that. But once, like you said, Bibber, when you go down by the dressing rooms and that first level, that is still all original. And when you walk around, you go to the original entrance that was built in 1952 and you still see the marble that has been there for 70 years. And you see where the original ticket office was. That is still just such, you know, it brings back such fond memories for me just as a kid and everybody else. So, you know, you go up into the upper, up into the arena and all that stuff that has been renovated, but there's still spots in that barn that are still original that are, I mean, just takes you back. And again, there's not that many buildings left. That's why I still love Kalamazoo. It's one of my all time favorites because it's an old hockey barn and there's just not that many around anymore. Kalamazoo, Glens Falls can stay claim to an old hockey Absolutely. barn. Absolutely. And- certain senses um and then there's a few in the ahl hope we get binghamton back playing minor pro at some point uh binghamton um piv knows i'm going to say syracuse because it is too that's where they if you film the scene in the freaking movie slap shot right in that <laughs> you're, you're, you're you're in a barn so i mean come on you know the war yeah. memorial arena there um do you have a, i kind of like always i don't have one here yet because there hasn't been a game yet at extreme arena which is gorgeous by the way you'll like it and uh i'll I'll permit you to sit in the second best broadcast booth, maybe in the country. Uh, we have a good, we have a good center ice spot for you here when, uh, when we see you in the fall, which is good. Yeah, no, it's a good, it's a great, great facility. Um, but anyway, so have don't have a spot here yet, but you know, there's always kind of like some areas of arenas where like you kind of just naturally just sit down there, whether it's for morning skate um, before game, a couple hours, if you just kind of want to sit somewhere quiet or do you have a place like that in, 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 in the arena there? In it, it, it's actually in, in uh, the press box where I normally sit yeah. um, because it is, it, it is kind of a sacred place. It's a place, you know, where, where Bob Chase called games. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously after the renovation, it was a little different, uh, but you know, he, he called uh, games, you know, for 60 years, you know, and I was his understudy for so long. And, you know, the day he passed away was, was Thanksgiving morning, uh, we had a game that night. We have a traditional Thanksgiving Day game. And I remember I got up there very, very early. I mean, I left the family. I left everybody. And I went up and I just sat in his chair for the first time without Bob. And it was the quietest, calmest, I mean, feeling that I had, I mean, come over me ever. And that has always kind of been my spot. I've been there. I know I get to the games three hours before our games. And I always are able just to sit in that spot. And just kind of take it all in, even if it's an empty building. And, you know, when you think about it, you know, there's, you know, just like last Friday night, you know, I knew there was going to be 10,500 people in there and it's totally quiet right now. And then just to soak it in. And that happens so often, you know, we, you know, the comments average great crowds over 8,000 over the years. So, you know, the building's going to be rocking, but you're able to get in and have that, just that moment and, and really appreciate what I have and what I've been able to do and how I'm so happy here in Fort Wayne. This was my dream since I was a little kid. I never had any aspirations to be a play-by-play announcer anywhere else, but for the Fort Wayne Comets and to follow Bob Chase. So no, I mean, just, just being in that spot, sitting in that chair and able to do what I do, that that's my spot. How'd you get involved with the Comets to start off? You know, you, you mentioned this is your dream job and not everyone gets their dream job. How'd you go about obtaining that? <laughs> Well, I've been with the team for my 24th year. Um, I started out being just the video guy. I just did all the team video. I pretty much just worked with the coaches and and, and stuff like that. Um, But I was into broadcasting. I I called my first hockey game when I was 17. 
when I was still in high school. So that was 1991. Oh man. Uh, so I know I was calling high school hockey games on a public access, uh, a, a station and the, I'm not sure if even public access stations even happen anymore but that's what I was doing and so you know my my life's goal was was always to, to, to follow Bob Chase and it was just turned into a chance meeting with me and uh, kind of President Michael Franke one day I was working as a production assistant at the local Fox affiliate and it was just we just kind of bumped into each other I'd been a season ticket holder since I was a kid you know the family had gone to every game since uh, the early 80s uh, so it was just a, just a chance random meetup and just a quick discussion and hey our video guy I don't think I think he's retiring we might need somebody can I give you a call and that's literally what it was a literally a chance bump in with Michael Franke and then you know once they learned I could do play by play uh you know Bob was getting older uh so it was a chance for me just to kind of be his understudy and if anything went wrong you know maybe health wise I could I could easily pop in there and then when it eventually got to the point where Bob was thinking about re retiring and and kind of uh, you know, he stopped doing road games and, you know, I was already part of the family. I was already uh, well-versed in hockey and broadcasting. I'd, I'd been in radio and TV uh, up until that point for, for 20 years until I actually got my chance to start doing games with Bob. So uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was an easy transition for them. They certainly wanted to keep it in the family. Uh, uh, so yeah, I mean, it, again, it just comes down to a chance meeting and just me continuing to work you know, I called everything. I called hockey. I called basketball. I called football. I called anything I could. You know, I never turned down a gig. As uh, another thing, as if I got a call from a radio station to call anything, I was there. Uh, so I, I constantly kept up the chops. And then, you know, Bob took me under his wing, and Bob very much approved of me. And that was really the big thing. It really wasn't so much the organization. It was Bob had to, had to approve of whoever was going to follow him because he certainly had earned that right uh, to, to pick to pick his uh, successor. How many years were you said understudy? How many years were you Bob's understudy? You know, I'm not even really sure, Dave. I mean, I got there, you know, 24 years ago and I, you know, would, would talk to Bob and it really wasn't so much I was the official understudy. Mm -hmm. I just sat and learned from Bob. You know, I sat next to him and I, and I would talk to Bob and, and you know, and, and Bob just took me in as one of his own. And, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, it just, I mean, you, you could honestly say 24 years because I was kind of the one there kind of learning everything from Bob. What, what was the, what's the magic like for someone that, doesn't know what, what what's that magic like of being able to sit next to him in the booth and be around him on a on a day-to-day -day basis it was wonderful I mean he was just 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 a beautiful human being I mean you just you just don't uh, I mean, he, he's, you know, the, the guys like that are just not made anymore. I mean, really, you know, here's a guy who, who served in World War II. Uh, you know, he's he's called every broad, everything you can imagine. He called the Indy 500 for decades. Uh, he called Big Ten football for decades. Um, he called, you know, the movie Hoosiers. Bob called that game. Uh, so, you know, he won the Lester Patrick award. So the NHL recognized him. Uh, if it wasn't for Bob Chase, we don't have a Doc Emmerich, uh, because, uh, Doc was, uh, w w was under his wing for many years as well. So, uh, yeah, I mean, just to, to, and, and he was so humble as well. I mean, he, he, you know, he was a big deal, but you know, he never took it that way. He was, he was just happy to be the broadcaster for the Fort Wayne Comets. He, he had a chance to go to the NHL so many times and he, he didn't want to because he was so, so in tune with the city of Fort Wayne and the radio station we were on, which is, we still are on, you know, WOWO radio has been around now for almost a hundred years. And uh, back in the day, it was a 50,000 watt radio station. It was one of the biggest in the country. So, you know, he can call an NHL game on a 6,000 watt radio station, or he could call a comic game on a 50,000 watt station and get it all over the country essentially. So uh, yeah, I mean, to be able to sit next to him and for him to accept me and, I remember the first game we got to do together. It was up in Kalamazoo. We did, we decided just to do a road game together and that's kind of where, where it started. And from that day on, you know, Bob was very comfortable and he, he kind of said, you know what, you know, I, I think you've got this. So if there was games where it's like, you know what, I mean, he was getting up there in his eighties and if he didn't feel well, he would say, Hey, go ahead and take the wheel tonight. <laughs> that's terrific. You were able to have such a great relationship and then, you know, get the dream job after being, you know, kind of having a, your mentor be someone you've looked up to for your entire life. So that's just terrific that you're able to do that. We have, I think one final question for you. I don't know. I'm going to let finer. Do you want to take this one or you want? Yeah. Me to, so, uh, I got Cause it. you can be I, involved in this now. So I, I'll, <laughs> I'll give this to you. 
<laughs> oh, I, I, there's no way I can replace, um, uh, replace, uh, uh, Everett Fitzhugh. No one can, oh. um, but there's, uh, there's a, there's the, 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 the seat, the, uh, yeah. there, what, uh, what, what is the, you know, I kind of know a little bit about it, but what's this, <laughs> there's a seat that would be passed. I need to know the full story here okay. is what we're asking for it. Who has Here's it, the- you know, who has it now? All the, all this stuff, just give us, give us the rundown here. Here's the story. One night, of course, Fort Wayne plays Cincy an awful lot. Yeah. Uh, so going back and forth a few years ago, in, in Cincy, you're, you don't have a press box. You're actually in yeah. a row of seats. And you've got a table. Yeah. Uh, so when I came in one night and sat in my normal spot, and it's like, you know, two or three seats into the row, the seat was broken. And it was like, everything else is pristine around it, but my seat. And I'm like, and it was just sitting there it's on the, on the ground, just the, just the, just the seat, just the, the seat itself. And I'm like, what is this ever? What is this? And I looked at him and I had it in my hand. I'm like, this is now our traveling trophy. Whoever wins it, <laughs> we have to pass it back and forth. So we gave it a wacky name that night. You know, it was something, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, 10 pages long just to, to make it even more funny. And, you know, it, so it, it kind of caught on because of course, after a while, if you if you won that night, you had to have Victor's take the spoils photos that we put on Twitter and, uh, you know, one guy celebrating one guy with a sad face. And it just kind of became a thing. And yeah, and, and people asked about it. And, uh, you know, I, I right now it's in Cincinnati in a vault somewhere. You know, Fitzy has gone on. I told him, you know, you, that, that move had to be approved by me because we got something going on here. I know you're going to the NHL, but. Uh, something has got to be done here. I don't know if we should retire it, if it's just between us, but, uh, you know, I was hoping it would catch on between other teams as well. I, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, rivalries where you got teams playing each other an awful lot where you could come up with, with great traveling trophies. And I think it should be something that needs to be pilfered from whatever arena. So it makes it just that much more fun. Oh yeah. Well, Shane, you can, you can go break stuff at uh, Extreme Arena if you want to. And then, uh... No, not in the first year. <laughs> give, it, give, it, give it a few years. Come on. <laughs> for sure. Hey, Shane, thanks for joining us here in Coast, and man. Appreciate it. Congratulations. I know it's, uh, it, it's a great feeling. Oh, I don't know. I've never got to experience the championship feeling yet uh, in anything that I've done in my life. But uh, I hope you get to enjoy it. Have a great off season. Well, we'll see you in Vegas in uh, about a month or so for league meetings. That's going to be fun to see all of our great colleagues again in a somewhat normal environment. Uh, it's just going to be fun. And again, thanks for everyone for tuning in for coasting for this entire regular season playoffs. It's been a blast. Yeah. Huge. huge. Um, I think we got about 30 episodes, Evan. I think we stopped counting after about 12, but yep. I think we're at about like 28, 29 or 30. 20, this is 29, I think. Yeah. So um, 30 episodes or almost 30 episodes. Um, it's been fun. We've had a lot of good conversations. Um, you know, I remember we had Garrett Sparks and Stefan Fournier as some of our first ones there. Um, we've had any, we had Doc Emmerich, <laughs> we had Brendan Burke, yeah. we had NHL broadcasters. Um, we've had a lot of players from around the league and um, can't forget Everett Fitzhugh as well, the voice of the Seattle Kraken. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's been pivot was a good way for you and I too, because I was in New Jersey slash Pennsylvania for the majority of, of season one. Um, and it was like, we were disconnected because at the time when I was with the Royals, they weren't playing, um, Adirondack didn't play this year. And it was kind of nice for us to, it made, it made me feel a little bit I hate to use the word normal. It just was, it was just fun to do because it's what we like to do to sit around, you know, talking about hockey and asking some dumb questions here and there. So here um, and there all the time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Majority of the time. So now that it was a great, it was a great season. Um, We had a ton of great guests and, you know, huge shout out and thanks to sound like such a hockey player, huge thanks to everyone at flow hockey for, for helping us to, to do this too. Um, We had Hunter Sharpless helping us out for most of it. And now, Lindsay kind of took the reins for the last few. So um, thanks to everyone at Flow Hockey for uh, allowing this uh, this idea to uh, to hatch and uh, giving us giving us some uh, some action on Flow Hockey TV. Yeah, and looking at the schedule, uh, I'm going to go to Iowa and I'm going to go to Glens Falls too. So I'm going to get to see both of you guys. Uh, That's right. Your, your element. That's got right. The, uh, got the schedule right behind me here. So uh, 
I'm not talking into the mic, talking to the mic, David, talking to the mic. See you in uh, November That's or right. in Vegas in then November. So there we yeah, go. Yeah. I think we see you in like March or something like that. Yeah. I, I think know. it's, I think it's the end of February. So we yeah. have to wait a while. <laughs> That's fine. You have fun. You have some, you know, trophy with David and then we'll see you for, for a few games in, uh, in Glens Falls in March. Shane, thanks again for the time, man. Appreciate it. This has been the final episode of this season of Coasting, presented by Flow Hockey TV. I'm Evan Pivnik. As always, David Fine. I don't know which side David's going to put himself on him here. But thanks for tuning in. Thanks for sticking with us. And we'll talk to you soon.